Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today we are diving into an important topic of the pediatric surgery that is the esophageal atresia. In this video we will get to know what it is, how it happens, its causes, how it affects the newborns, its types, signs and symptoms, diagnoses and the treatment and also about the complications. So let's jump right in. Esophageal atresia is a rare birth defect that affects the baby's esophagus. We already know esophagus is a tube that connects the oral cavity with the stomach and passes the food from your mouth to the stomach. The esophageal atresia is a medical condition, I mean a congenital medical condition, where the esophagus ends in a blind-ended pouch rather than connecting normally to the stomach. So, it ultimately prevents the food and the fluids from reaching the stomach. This condition is often associated with or without the tracheoesophageal fistula. That means in addition to the blind-ended pouch, the esophagus might be connected with the trachea in front. This abnormal connection of the trachea with the esophagus is called tracheoesophageal fistula. This condition results from either the posterior deviation of the tracheoesophageal septum or if the wall of the foregut is pushed anteriorly by some mechanical factors. You need to understand the development of the esophagus to know what is tracheoesophageal septum or what is foregut. I've made a separate video on this topic. I would like to advise you to watch that video first before watching this video to understand this process more clearly. Now the causes. The exact cause of esophageal atresia is not fully understood, but it is believed to be caused by abnormalities in the baby's genes. Recently, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, aka CDC, reported some important factors that might increase the risk of having a baby with esophageal atresia. According to them, the number one factor is paternal age. They reported that the older age of the father is related to an increased chance of having a baby with esophageal atresia. And number two factor is assisted reproductive technology, also known as ART. CDC found that women who used ART have an increased risk of having a baby with esophageal atresia compared to women who did not use ART. Now what are the types of the esophageal atresia? There are four types of esophageal atresia, type A, type B, type C, and type D. Type A is also known as the long gap or pure or isolated esophageal atresia. In this type, the upper and the lower parts of the esophagus do not connect and have closed ends. There will be a long gap between the two esophageal blind pouches with no fistula present. Type B is very rare. In this type, the upper part of the esophagus connects abnormally to the trachea. The lower esophageal pouch ends blindly. Type C is the most common type and here the upper esophageal pouch ends blindly and the lower part of the esophagus connects abnormally to the trachea. Type D is the rarest but the most severe one. In this type, the upper and the lower parts of the esophagus make an abnormal connection with the trachea in two separate isolated places. So these are the abnormalities seen in the esophageal atresia. But nearly half of these babies have one or more additional birth defects such as uh, the problems in the GIT, I mean the digestive system, especially in the intestines or in the anus, also in the heart, kidneys, the limbs or the vertebral column. This is known as the vectoral association. Here, V is for vertebral column, A for anorectal, C for cardiac, T means trachea, E for esophageal, R for renal, and finally, L represents the limbs. So, a baby born with esophageal atresia should also be checked in these regions if there is any other additional abnormalities. The presence of esophageal atresia is suspected in an infant with excessive salivation or drooling of the saliva and that is frequently accompanied by choking, coughing or sneezing. When fed, 
these infants swallow normally but begin to cough and struggle and the fluid returns back through the nose or the mouth. Why it happens? Because the milk collects in the blind pouch and overflows into the trachea and the lungs, causing the infant to cough, choke and the milk returns back through the mouth and the nose as well. The infant may become cyanotic. Cyanotic means the infant will turn bluish due to lack of oxygen and may stop breathing as the overflow of fluid from the blind pouch is aspirated into the trachea and into the lungs. The cyanosis is a result of laryngospasm that is a protective mechanism of the body to prevent the aspiration into the trachea because your body does not want those foods to enter into your lungs. That is why the laryngospasm happens to prevent the aspiration. Over time, respiratory distress will develop in these cases. The ultimate signs and symptoms of the esophageal atresia are excessive salivation or drooling of the saliva, while feeding, the baby starts coughing or choking. Fluid returns through the mouth and the nose after feeding. Bluish coloration of the skin, known as the cyanosis, especially after feeding. And difficulty in breathing. Furthermore, a fistula between the lower esophagus and the trachea may allow the stomach acid to flow into the lung and cause the damage. If any of the above signs or symptoms are noticed, a catheter is gently passed into the esophagus to check for resistance. If resistance is noted, other studies will be done to confirm the diagnosis. On plain x-ray, a feeding tube will be seen not passing through the esophagus and will remain coiled in the upper esophageal pouch. In antenatal ultrasonography, I mean during the pregnancy, we easily find polyhydramnions in addition to absent stomach or small stomach. Now you may ask why there is polyhydramnions in esophageal atresia and what is it? Polyhydramnions means excessive amount of the amniotic fluid in the amniotic cavity. We know that the fetus floats in the amniotic fluid in the uterus and it swallows the amniotic fluid. Swallowing amniotic fluid helps in the development of the gastrointestinal tract and it provides the essential nutrition and helps in maturation of the digestive system and it also aids in the regulation of the amniotic fluid volume. In case of esophageal atresia, the fetus cannot swallow the fluid, so the amount of the amniotic fluid starts increasing, known as the polyhydramnions. That is why you will find polyhydramnions in esophageal atresia. Another confirmatory sign of esophageal atresia is the upper neck pouch sign. This is a radiological finding of esophageal atresia. In esophageal atresia, the upper esophageal pouch is often dilated and appears as a pouch-like structure in the upper neck region on imaging studies such as the x-rays or fluoroscopy. It indicates the presence of the blind dent of the upper esophagus that fails to connect with the lower esophagus and the stomach. Apart from these, the babies with esophageal atresia may sometimes have other associated anomalies as I've mentioned earlier such as the factual association. Studies should be done to look at the heart, spine, kidneys, anus and limbs as well to see if they are okay. Now the treatment strategy. If esophageal atresia or tracheoesophageal fistula is suspected, all oral feedings are stopped and intravenous fluids are started for maintaining the nutrition. The infant will be positioned to drain the secretions and also to decrease the likelihood of the aspiration, otherwise he might develop aspirational pneumonia from its own saliva. A suction tube is used to remove the fluid from the pouch as well. After the diagnosis, surgery is needed to repair the defect. The baby will be taken to the neonatal intensive care unit or the NICU where he will be given the general anesthesia. The surgeon makes an incision on the right side of the chest between the ribs and closes the fistula between the esophagus and the trachea. They will then reconnect the upper and the lower parts of the esophagus. If the gap of the esophagus is large, the baby may need to wait for a few months for the operation so that the esophagus grows a bit more in that time and the ends can be reconnected. During this time, a feeding tube is temporarily placed into the stomach of the baby through the abdominal wall. 
Occasionally, a procedure to lengthen the esophagus before the repairing is carried out. There are many other different procedures. Your doctor will advise you the best suitable option for your baby, but surgery is a must. There is no other choice. After the surgery, the child will be kept in the intensive care unit and will be placed in an incubator. There, they will need antibiotics, uh, pain medication, oxygen, and they may also need a machine to help them breathe, uh, I mean the ventilator, and also a tube into their chest to drain the fluids or air that might be trapped. The baby will be given nutrition intravenously at first, but you should be able to feed them after a few days. The baby can be taken to the home once they start taking food by mouth. This usually takes one or two weeks. Parents will be advised about how to feed the child by the doctors. Parents should contact immediately with the hospital if the child is choking or coughing on their feet, or has any difficulty while swallowing or is failing to gain weight. Most of the children after the surgery will have normal lives, but there are chances that the child may experience some further problems, such as some postoperative complications that may include leakage at the site of the closure of the esophagus. Sometimes that may uh, also increase the chances of infection, and sometimes a stricture may develop in the esophagus at the site of the repair, making it difficult to swallow. These strictures can be dilated using medical instruments. Esophageal dysmobility occurs in many patients. After esophageal repair, the relative flaccidity of previous proximal pouch along with esophageal dysmobility can cause fluid buildup during feeding. And this fluid buildup in the pouch will ultimately lead to pouch ballooning. And this pouch ballooning can compress in front and may cause tracheal occlusion. Severe hypoxia or the dying spells follows. And medical intervention is a must in this case. Tracheomalacia, that means the softening of the trachea, is another possible serious complication. A variety of treatments for tracheomalacia are available. The incidence of asthma, bronchitis, bronchial hyperresponsiveness far exceeds that of their healthy peers. Pneumonia has remained as a major pulmonary complication and is a reason for readmissions in the hospital. In conclusion, esophageal atresia is a challenging condition that requires prompt diagnosis and specialized care. If you suspect your newborn is suffering from the esophageal atresia, seek medical attention immediately. So that is all about esophageal atresia. Thank you for watching. Hope this content helped you. Do not forget to like, share and subscribe for more informative contents. So take care and goodbye.